Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Breaking Barriers, A Journey to Elevate Student Success in a High DFW Course. I'm Diane Marks, and I'm joined by my colleague, Ed Ferdicella. And also, we have a bunch of digital learning IDs from FGCU. Hi, everyone. CJ, Katie, Kinty, and Lacey are here. Um, and they'll help field some of those questions as we go along. We're really excited to share some of the strategies and technologies that we found that boost student success in face-to-face -face classes that are tech enhanced. So let's talk a little bit about our agenda. We're gonna do some introductions um, and then Ed's gonna tell us a little bit about the problems uh, from the course that we wanted to address. We're gonna take a deep dive into four solutions that we found um, met our goals for success. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the results, where we're at right now, and then where we're wanting to go in the future and how we might get there. And then of course, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, we'd like to hear your experiences, um, any resources that you have, and any questions that you have for us. So I think Tom did a great job of introducing me. Um, again, I'm just gonna run through it real quick. So I'm the senior instructional designer in the digital learning department at Florida Gulf Coast University. I've been here about eight years. Before I came to FGCU, I was a tenured full professor at Appalachian State University in beautiful Boone, North Carolina. And I was there for about 10 years. And then way back early in my career, I was an elementary school teacher in the Orlando area. And I taught elementary school for 13 years, every grade except fifth grade. And so altogether, I've been in education for over 30 years, as you can see by the gray hair. And I am really excited to join you today and talk about some successes that we have with Ed's course. Ed, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. My name's Ed Ferdisella, and again, Tom did a nice job for me. I'm retired from banking and education. I've got 25 years of experience as a financial executive and member of the board of directors at a community bank in Northwest Indiana. And then I have 25 years of experience teaching. I've taught grade school, high school, and university classes. Prior to coming to Florida Gulf Coast University, I did teach at Purdue University Northwest. I was an adjunct there for 10 years during my banking days, and then 12 years I was a full-timer serving as the department chair of accounting, head of the master's of accounting program, and a clinical professor of accounting. Like Tom said, I've been at Florida Gulf Coast University since June 2017. I'm an adjunct instructor, and I teach introductory accounting classes. Thanks, Ed. Tell us a little bit about some of the issues that we wanted to address with this project. Yeah, first of all, the course is an introduction to financial accounting. It's a required course for all college of business majors. Students have to receive a C in this course to proceed with their plan of study. We typically offer eight to 10 sections every semester and class size ranges from 50 to 60 students. Students are high school students, college freshmen, mostly college sophomores though. We have a lead instructor because there's so many sections and the lead instructor creates chapter videos, sets the schedule, creates assignments, quizzes, and exams. So that's the course. The problem with this course is the DFW rate is historically 50% or higher. Students are taking this course two, three, and four times before they're able to progress under plan of study. For me, I've been teaching this class since spring 2018. My average class size has been 52, and I've taught it 17 times. My DFW rate, in spring 2018 was 50.9% with a DF rate of 31.1%. Needless to say, 
I wasn't happy with what was going on here. I felt like things were broken and change had to be made. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert at this point. By the spring of 2024, last semester, the DFW rate dropped to 17.4% with a DF rate of 13%. That's what this webinar is all about. Change was needed and changes were made. Diane and I are here today to talk and share with you the changes that took place. So specifically, we identified five challenges that we wanted to address. We wanted to look closely at student motivation, student persistence, student engagement, meeting individual student needs, and student-teacher relationships. Now, these are common challenges that all of us have faced at one time or another. And it's our hope that when you leave our webinar, that you take one strategy or one technology with you to try in your own courses. Ed's going to tell us a little bit about um, what our solution would look like. What was our goal? Yeah, you know, the goal is not unique. It's why we're all here today. We want to provide a learning experience to all our students that gives them opportunity to realize their personal goals. The game plan here was to improve student engagement, build a curiosity for learning, and create an environment that provides choice and encourages reflection and feedback. My overall quest here is that students learn the material and at the same time, we're able to reduce that DFW rate to 20% or less. So in the end, we identified four solutions that helped us to reach our goals. Professional development, technology enhanced course design, creating a sense of belonging, and then RSI, that regular acceptative interaction. In the next part of our presentation, we'll dive deeper into each of these solutions. Ed will give you specific strategies that he used, and then I'll give you some technologies um, that we use to save some time and effort. So a little caveat, the solutions are not rocket science. There are no advanced degrees needed in technology or teaching and instruction. These are just high impact strategies and technologies that are found in almost every LMS today. These are the easy strategies and easy technologies that give you the biggest bang for your buck that made a huge change for ed student success. So let's take a deep dive. We're gonna start with professional development. And we know that participating in professional development offerings is beneficial to faculty efficacy, specifically, they learn skills for instruction, they learn new technologies, they have time to reflect on their practice, they collaborate across disciplines, across campus and departments. And most of all, we know that it improves student outcomes. So Ed's gonna tell us a little bit about some professional development offerings that he took and the impact that they made on his student success numbers. For me, professional development was both formal and informal interaction with instructional designers. And then I had directed guidance from the Lucas Center for Faculty Development. What I did was I participated in workshops, learning academies, and I had plenty of one-on-ones with Dr. Marks. The benefits of this was that it created awareness for me of the digital tools, the books, the podcasts, and all the resources needed for change. Prior to my professional development at FGCU, I felt like I had good intentions, but I had no idea of the value that things like UDL, DEI, Q&M standards brought to the table. My old game plan was to set learning objectives, create activities, and assess results. My new, plan, my new plan as a result of the professional development continues to set learning objectives and create activities, 
but also allows for choices, mistakes, reflection, and feedback before assessment takes place. Great, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about two elements of our professional development offerings that I think are kind of innovative and unique at FGCU. So the first one is that we use the concierge model for instructional design. And the concierge model is where instructional designers are assigned to departments and we serve all faculty in those departments. And so we build these really great long-term relationships with faculty. They call us for everything. It's like one-stop shopping. We try not to send them to another uh, department or send them to another person. We try hard to answer their questions right away. And so building this relationship is really beneficial for us. It helps us to better understand their professional development needs. And when they ask us questions or they ask for resources, we're better able to give them resources that fit their context because we know them and we know their teaching context. We also feel like this relationship serves faculty better. They feel like we're a safe place they can call and ask any question, no judgment. And also it's a place where we can sort of negotiate taking a risk. Um, they want to try something new, and oftentimes they will try something new because of that relationship that we've built with them. So again, this concierge model is sort of the foundation for professional development at FTCU. The second element that is pretty interesting, I think, is the innovative and faculty-centered offerings that we have. So these offerings are 100% online. And even if faculty want to come and meet with us face to face, they're welcome to come into the office. But every workshop, every book club, every academy is online so that it's accessible to all of our faculty and adjuncts. Our offerings are self-paced. So faculty can join us when it's good time for them. Faculty can take as long or as short as they need to complete whatever it is that they're interested in learning about in our offerings. It is completely up to them. And even though our offerings are 100% online and self-paced, they're still facilitated by a live instructional designer. Designers are assigned to every academy and workshop. And every day we go in and we see if somebody submitted something and they need feedback, if they have questions that we can answer, or if they're asking for additional resources. So again, we work really hard to maintain that relationship that we have with faculty. We also have offerings that are flexible to meet the diverse needs of faculty. So they come to us with all kinds of different skills and interests, and teaching contexts, and we want to make sure that our offerings meet those needs. So some of the design and delivery elements that we've used to meet those differentiated needs is we use standalone modules in all of our workshops and our academies. And these standalone modules help faculty to target just-in-time information. I want to know more about grading for equity. I want to know more about creating community. I want to know more about using AI. They go to that module, it's a standalone module, they get a certificate of completion, and they can move on to something else. We also offer lots of choices. Again, they all have different interests and different abilities. So we want faculty to have choices with their content. What are they interested in learning right now? We also give them choices for reflective practice. What reflection resonates with them right now? What are they interested in thinking about? And then finally, all of the activities that they do, what do they want to create for their course right now? And so all of these design and development, they come together to make not a one-off academy where, oh, I already took that academy, I don't need to go back. Our academies are a resource, an ongoing resource for faculty to return to over and over again. And we really like the fact that those modules are really easy to update and to add new modules if we need to. So again, they remain a resource for faculty throughout their career at FGCU. Another solution we found, Ed's class is face-to-face, -face, but we found that a technology-enhanced course design is really important for student success. 
Students come to your class for a couple of hours every week, but students are doing most of their work outside of class. And that's when they need the re resources and support. And so creating a robust online course full of resources, full of examples for students is a great way to boost student success. So Ed's gonna share some of his design elements that he felt were most important for student success in his class. Yeah, even though my class is face-to-face, -face, I do try wherever possible to use to utilize technology to deliver an effective and efficient class. I've made sure that my LMS course is well organized. It's easy to navigate. It's a one-stop shop for information and resources. My homepage provides a game plan announcement for each week easy access to policies, resources, assignments, and modules. My weekly modules identify the class prep, the in-class, and the after-class activities that are going to take place. All the files are uploaded to the Canvas system for easy access by the students. The weekly work schedule is posted on my homepage, and it's based on a routine that's followed each and every week of the semester. I call it my Groundhog's Day schedule because every week we do the same thing. There's no surprises for the students. Students have made it clear to me that they appreciate a well-organized, easy to navigate Canvas course. Giving them this results in one less thing for them to worry about. Thanks, Ed. So you can imagine when the instructional designer says to a faculty member teaching face to face who is planning in class activities, planning their lectures, using the technology in the classrooms. And I say to them, you know, it would be a great idea if we could create a robust campus course. Ah, It's a huge ask. It's a huge effort. So as designers in digital learning, we try really hard to take as much of that design work off of the backs of the faculty. And one thing that we've done is that we've created a customizable course template for them. And this helps them to sort of envision what that online course might look like. Um, it has stuff like a start here module. It has a communication plan template. Um, it has introduction activities, muddiest point discussion forms in every module. And then it has sort of a template for every module also. It helps faculty to just put their content into the course and not have to worry so much about the design elements. We also help faculty with multimedia. So the option for moving things into an online environment is that you have this place where you can put multimedia for students. And you know, that really brings the course content to life. And it also bumps up that teacher presence that we're always working towards. So some of the ways that we help faculty to integrate multimedia into this tech enhanced course is we pull things from the internet. So it might be that they're pulling from YouTube or Khan Academy or TED Talks, or maybe there are professional websites or government websites that they wanna use. We also help them with publisher materials. And though they may not use the publisher materials in their entirety, there are oftentimes videos, PowerPoints, activities that enhance student learning. And then finally, to bump up that teacher presence, we like to help them with instructor-created materials. They might do an introduction to a topic. They might help discuss an assignment that is a complicated or difficult assignment. And they might summarize a difficult concept or unpack a difficult concept for students in a video. Um, and that's incredibly helpful. And then finally, as faculty are putting all of this information online, we want to make sure that it's high quality. And so we created a high quality tech enhanced course rubric. Um, and it has all the elements that we feel are most important and represent a high quality online course. And so faculty use this rubric. Sometimes they use it by themselves self-reflectively, or sometimes we do it together and we go through their course and go through the rubric and they find out what they're doing well. And then they find out Hmm, what they might need to do a little better. And for that, of course, there's an academy. So we created the Tech Enhanced Course Design Academy. 
And again, that has all the standalone modules that are aligned with that rubric. So faculty can look through the rubric and say, ah, I need to learn more about assessment. And they go and they complete the assessment module. So again, we do everything that we can to help pull the burden of design off of the faculty members so that they can do what they do best, which is provide the content. So the next solution we found was the sense of belonging. And we all have heard about how important it is to have a sense of belonging. We all want to learn and be a valued part of a learning environment, a group of peers who are learning along with us. We don't want to learn in isolation. So when you have a face-to-face -face class, that is incredibly challenging. You meet a couple of hours a week, you meet a couple of days a week, you have a busy class planned, answering questions, giving lectures, planning activities for students, and sustaining that sense of belonging is challenging. But we feel that with a strong online presence in your tech enhanced course, that sense of belonging has a place where it can thrive. And so Ed's gonna share his strategies for fostering a sense of belonging in his class. You know, like Diane says, everyone wants to belong. You know, and I feel like this begins right from the get-go. I start every semester by creating a getting started module. The module allows the students to get familiar with me as well as their colleagues. I create a seating chart with a goal of learning everyone's names by the fourth session. I create a survey to kick off the semester that allows me to know their goals, how they feel they best learn, and what they think about the class itself. During the semester, I encourage collaboration on all classwork. I allow for flexible due dates. I call these the grace periods with the students. Tuesday assignments are available until Thursday evening. Friday homework is available until Sunday evening. 90% of my students submit their work by the due date. The grace period allows students to improve their scores, ensure submission of all work, and gets rid of excuses. I also allow multiple attempts. Multiple attempts allow students to learn from their mistakes. The focus on attempts is to incorrect questions and avoids the frustration of making them redo the entire assignment. Allowing for multiple attempts and flexible due dates gives students the opportunities to make choices and to learn from their mistakes. Each semester, I also have what I call a zero free gradebook goal. I believe that completing all assignments. Uh, sorry, Ed. So I think Ed will be coming back in again. So you sort of heard what his plan is there for um, student success. And he gives them plenty of opportunities to learn from their mistakes and to get feedback from him. Um, and then the last thing Ed was going to talk about is his student-centered office hours where he posts office hours a couple of times during the week. He spreads it out so that students can come and meet with him one-on-one -on -one in small groups um, when the time is right for them. So as Ed is coming back on, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some technologies because all of these um, strategies that Ed has used for a sense of belonging, they can take up a lot of time and energy, but there's technologies that can streamline your efforts. So use video. Pre-recorded videos are great. They bump up teacher presence and your connection with students. You can create a, week, a welcome video, weekly videos, sort of introducing the topics, um, telling students this week it's gonna be a long reading or you know I have a summary for this reading, it's gonna be complicated. You might also create summaries of complicated reading so that students can sort of get an idea of the whole picture before they go and dive deeper into the chapter. Discussion boards are your friend. So again, sense of belonging of being part of a learning community is really important for student motivation and engagement and persistence. And a lot of times they're doing their new learning at home all by themselves. And they're wondering, 
Am I on track? Do I know what's going on? Is my question going to be considered a stupid question? What's everybody else thinking? So if you create some discussion boards for pre-flexions before they come to class, where students have the opportunity to talk about their challenges, to ask their questions, to talk about what they think is important, what they agree with or disagree with, not only do they feel more confident and more a sense of value and belonging, but they're much more prepared for the activities you have planned in class. Ed also talked about um, those assignment features that he uses, uh, allowing for a span of time for things to be uh, submitted or giving multiple attempts. And in the past, this was like a clerical nightmare. But lots of LMS systems these days, right in every assignment, have these options that you can utilize to give students the extra time they need or the extra practice that they need to succeed. And then I'm back to video again. So we've all had this happen. Students email you, they have a question. You email them back, there have, you give them the answer, they don't understand, there's a misunderstanding, you go back and forth, back. it's three days later and still no answer. Students and faculty get kind of miffed by this and there's that big separation between you. So I always say, look, utilize the video. If you see something like the starting, pop in and just say, hey, let's pop on Zoom and talk for five minutes. And that shows the student that you value them. I want you to have an answer. Let's talk about this face-to-face. -face. All right, so we're gonna move on. I think we're having storms here in Florida, so I think Ed had a power outage. So I'm going to probably just handle the last part for him while he logs back in again. So the last solution we found is RSI, Regular and Substantive Interaction, which I know, right? We talk about all the time for online courses, but think about that for a face-to-face -face course. It's just not enough contact for students to stay motivated and to stay engaged for those two or three hours in class and then on you know, any comments or you, know, you give them on their assignments. So we have to find ways that sustain that and have consistent communications with students. And Ed found through some of his strategies that he could sustain student interest and persistence throughout the week by using some of these RSI strategies. So one of the first strategies he used is keeping those lines of communication open outside the face-to-face -face class. And so it's critical for student motivation and engagement for them to know that even though he's not teaching the class, that he is in the class, engaged with them, and the communication is open between them. He uses discussions to reassure challenges. Every single homework has a discussion forum where students can discuss questions, challenges, ideas, thoughts, and it makes students feel, again, like they are part of a learning community, but Ed chimes in as well, and he helps with misconceptions, he helps to answer questions that nobody else has answered, and again, throughout the week, they know that he is there for them. He gives them continuous communication through office hours. Again, he opens his office hours on Saturday morning, throughout the week, whenever they need him, he is there to talk to them, through the video, not just email. He also sends out a weekly pep talk. This is amazing. So through announcements, he sends out a little video that gives them some encouragement and a little bit of structure about what's going on that week for the class. He also provides timely and specific feedback for his students. Um, the students are in an accounting class but he makes sure that he nudges students who don't have submissions. He encourages students to come see him who aren't meeting the goals. And he also makes sure that he lets students know who are exceeding the goals and he congratulates them and that he sees that they're working hard. So what are some technologies that can help with this? Again, RSI is really laborious and it can take a lot of time, but there's a lot of technologies that we can use to help with that. The first one, again, is the discussion boards. 
So instead of using discussion boards before class, now I'm saying, let's think about what discussion boards can do for you and students after class. So discussion boards are a great place for students to have that reflective practice, that metacognition about what they've learned, how it connects to other concepts in the class, what questions do they still have, and what aha moments might they have had. This is an opportunity again for you to chime in and to meet students, to interact with students on a regular basis through these discussion boards. The other way that you can use a discussion board is to well, so you know in a face-to-face -face class you're having a great discussion and all of a sudden you're like, we gotta stop, we gotta move on. And you hate to do that. You can move that discussion online. And the most interesting thing about that is, is that the whole group of students who you never hear from, now they all chime in. And this also gives you the time to interact with individual students throughout the week in a more consistent way. Sending those pep talks via email, we decided is just not best practice. It gets lost in the shuffle, students can't go back and find them. So we often advise faculty to use announcements instead. Um, the announcements stay in the course, they're always in the course, and we have courses set in Canvas so that the last three announcements are on the home page. We also have students set their preferences and notifications so that they get an alert when um, Ed sends them a new announcement. And then all that feedback, right? We're all thinking, well, if we were retired, we could give that kind of feedback. But there's a lot of stuff in the LMS that can help you with your time and effort. Again, video is a good friend of yours. So instead of writing out the feedback, use the video option or the audio option. And that way, it's sort of a win-win. You save time and effort, and the students get a chance to hear your voice and see your face, which is teacher presence. You can't beat it. Use the feature from the Canvas gradebook, message students who. Again, we want to have this regular and substantive interaction with students. It's time consuming, but you can use this feature to nudge students, encourage students, and to let students know that you appreciate their hard work, the ones that are succeeding beyond expectation. And then finally, Canvas has a great option called Comments Library. And even though we're giving it individualized feedback, we wanna make sure that we don't make ourselves crazy with that. It always falls into themes, right? So you find yourself sort of writing the same thing over and over again. And so using the comment library, you can use those common comments to save yourself that time and effort. All right, so where are we? Did we meet our goals? And what are our next steps? So Ed isn't back yet, I think his power is off. So I'm going to go into this part with you about the results. And these are pretty, um, I think, amazing results. It's a lot of hard work, but in the spring of 2024, the DFW rate for his course was down to 17.4%, which he told you. The student perception of instruction, which is like our SPOI, uh, the evaluation of the teacher, um, it had a 51.1% response rate, which is double what we usually get. And all of the SPOIs that he got were favorable um, for the changes that he made. And then the bottom line is that these student, these initiatives work and that the students appreciate them. So where are we going next? So next, the goal for fall 2024 is 20% 20 or less DFW. We also have taken the section offerings from 10 to 15, so they dropped the class size from 52 to 35. So I think that's going to make a giant um, bump in student success too. And then I think Ed, he's really uh, got his eye on that zero free grade book. So he's gonna continue to work on nudging students, giving grace periods, multiple attempts to see if he can get a zero free grade book. And then finally, he's going to try to convince the others teaching the same class, the different sections, to take some of these strategies or some of these technologies and give them a whirl and see if they can make an impact 
on their student success too. So that's sort of where we're at. Well, our presentation's at an end now, and we'd like to hear your thoughts and your experiences or your questions. So go ahead and unmute yourself or put your comments in the chat, and we'd be more than happy to um, answer those for you.